Oh, okay. That works. Um, um, hold on. So when you stop, when you stop talking, I will unmute me to talk back, and then I will mute. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to mute now, and then you do the introduction. So it's it's 19 minutes 34 in se testing this up. So we're going live in let's say it's 1941. It, we'll do it at um, 1950. Four, three, two. One cameras action. Morning, Roger. Today we had a chat about your going direct paradigm mind map, which has I asked you what's it for, uh, why are you doing this, and you said um, I've been researching uh, pretty much since two thousand and nine and collecting the information to do with financial crashes, how things work with respect to the media, the internet, the government, the business cycle and games that are being played by shall we say powers that be you referred to epistemology and ontology and knowledge and belief and the way in which these can intersect and effectively you were saying why you have looked at the world in the ways that you have what you believe what you're prepared to believe so that you can then go out there and one could say make money but also just be interacting with people in a way that you think is honest and works so the level playing field really and so there are little things that prevent that and it's only by talking about those things that we can get to a position where they can be overcome and they can potentially be overcome daily so i think that's what you were talking about that this spring is going to be a recovery point potentially from the various uh, control elements of the last few years so that hopefully um, society can flourish, people can vote the way they want, do business, and we can get on with things in ways that we've been prevented from doing. Uh, that's the end of my introduction. I'm looking forward to seeing the documents that you've put together um, in whichever order you go through them. Great, thanks, Ranjan. So, um, yes, ju just 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 to summarise, um, there's an old sort of uh, cliche: never trust a chef that doesn't eat their own cooking. So, basically, what I said is that um, uh, true justified belief, all of the stuff that I've put together is stuff that I am acting on in my own life, my own business life, my own personal life, um, and uh, I'm an authentic person. I am Roger Lewis, I'm not some internet avatar, and um, this is how I believe the world is and the best way to act in my own interests without harming other people in the context of society, etc. cetera. Um, so where we are at the moment, what I'm saying is we've the opportunity to do the going direct spring. Um, going direct was the plan by BlackRock, which is the Great Reset and all of the um, anti-human sort of um, climate catastrophe, uh, millenarian um, stuff that is shot through the belief systems of the faction of the oligarchy that's running the show. The, 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 the masters of the universe are the central bankers and the international bankers, what's known as the money power. Uh, Lord Acton said that, you know, things will boil down and ultimately there has to be the battle of, of the people against the banks. And so a lot of that feeds into how I think um, we can act to try and get prosperity back into our local communities. So... Um, the working title for this blog was Philosophy, the Love of Truth. Uh, it's a work in progress. This is not the first draft anymore, uh, but it is the final draft before editing. And so um, the first thing here is the front of the famous pamphlet by Edmund Burke, Thoughts on the Cause of the Present Discontents, okay, um, which has a... Uh, Latin motto 
um, or, which basically says this secret internal and domestic evil not only exists, but even overwhelms you before you can foresee it or examine into it. And that was Cicero against Verres, second pleading, uh, 139, translated by Charles Duke Jung, 1903. So, um, so Burke called it a behind hand review when in his famous pamphlet, he said that it is rare to find supporters of past failed tyrannies. When he spoke those words, Burke was referring to the failed establishment of his time. We're living in another failed establishment, and that is why his words are so extant relevant in our present times. Um, now, this is quite a long quote, OK, uh, but I'm going to read it because it encapsulates, I think, um, where we need to get our heads at to know what we're up against, the, the, you know, the money power. Um, I did a series of interviews with Roy Madron, who wrote a book called Guy and Democracies in 2011. Um, on, it, on, on, on his bo book after, I, I helped with some of the editing of the book, and we did a series of videos, um, which is on another YouTube channel, which I set up called super competent democracies um and um the uh roy coined the term the money power another blogger that i read a lot in those days is a guy called toby russell and toby russell's an uh, englishman living in berlin um and his blog uh is is something that's been you know very informative to me uh, and he calls the money power the Danistocracy. Um, you, you'll find references to that in uh, the blog I did called the um, the Iron Law of Oligarchy. But anyway, here's here's Burke on on these things. Few are the partisans of departed tyranny, and to be a Whig on the business of a hundred years ago is very consistent with every advantage of present servility. This retrospective vis wisdom and historical patriotism are things of wonderful convenience and serve admirably to reconcile the old quarrel between speculation and practice. Many a stern Republican, after gorging himself with a full feast of admiration of the Grecian Commonwealths and of our true Saxon constitution, and discharging all the splendid bile of his virtuous indignation of King John and King James, sits down perfectly satisfied to the coarsest work and homeliest job of the day he lives in. I believe there was no professed admirer of Henry VIII among the instruments of the last King James, nor in the court of Henry VIII was there, I dare say, to be found a single advocate for the favourites of Richard II. No complacence to our court or to our age can make me believe nature to be so changed, but that public liberty will be among us, as among our ancestors, obnoxious to some person or other, and that opportunities will be furnished for attempting at least some alteration to the prejudice of our constitution. These attempts will naturally vary in their mode according to times and circumstances. For ambition, though it has ever the same general views, has not at all times the same means, nor the same particular objects. A great deal of the furniture of ancient tyranny is worn to rags. The rest is entirely out of fashion. Besides, there are few statesmen so very clumsy and awkward in their business as to fall into the identical snare which has proved fatal to their predecessors. When an arbitrary imposition is attempted upon the subject, undoubtedly it will not bear on its forehead the name of ship money. This is no danger that an extension of the forest laws should be the chosen mode of oppression in this age. And when we hear any instance of ministerial rapacity to the prejudice of the rights of private life, it will certainly not be the exact exaction of 200 pullets for a woman of fashion for leave to lie with her own husband. Every age has its own manners and its politics dependent upon them, and the same attempts will not be made against the constitution fully formed and matured that were used to destroy it in the cradle or to resist its growth during its interest infancy. So in our own behindhand review, it is sufficient to take our reference frame of the past 50 years. 1975 to 2025 plus or minus five years or so 1970 to 2020 or 1980 to 2030 
So the next thing in the blog then is this PDF that I put together. There's a download link. And if you click on that link, um, it the PDF is on the site. You can enlarge different parts of it and all these links work. OK, so there's a link, for instance, to the article called The Dash for Cash. There is um, a timeline at the at the top, which is actually from 1980 to uh, the current time. And all these links work and explain key events at those particular times. There's the positive money, uh, money creation quiz. There's a link to Richard Werner's paper um, on um uh creation of money and so forth uh, two really interesting links are all the financial penalties that financial institutions and other corporate bodies have paid over the years there's there's a database of those and the figures are massive and so the criminality is basically paid for they pay indulgences to the state to rip off their customers that's what they do um, and, you know, you can see pharmaceutical companies are in there, but by far and away, the biggest offenders are in financial services. It's the banks, then the pharma people, real estate, my lot, we're right low down the list. Um, but that's a really interesting graphic that I made. In fact, it's so sort of explosive that, that the links get killed by Google now and again. But I you know, I keep backups of stuff and I've put it back up. I don't know how long it will last. So, uh, you know, get get it while it's hot. So hold on a, uh, second. Hold on a second. Hold on. Yep. Uh, quick question. What was the link between the quote and the type of information that you made available below it? The, the quote is basically that we're living in the same sort of time that Burke was um, uh, actually setting out when when that when when that pamphlet was published, which was in the late late 18th century. So, you know, in the, the late 1790s, you see. Um, and what he's actually saying is, is that the current circumstances, while slightly different, when, when a state or the power behind, you know, the, the beneficiaries of the power of the state uh, is acting in a bad way, it won't tend to dress, dress it up. So, for instance, ship money was a tax to build ships to have war, and it was called ship money. If they want to have a war, you don't call it ship money next time, you call it something else. The one about leave to lay with your wife, pullets are chickens, and there was a law that you had to pay a tax if you wanted to have sex with your partner. That, that's actually true. Some people say that fuck stands for uh, fucking under command of the king. Right? I mean, whether it does or not, there was such a thing of having to pay a stamp duty, uh, you know, it's basically a stup duty. <laughs> you know, stupping is fucking in, in, in Yiddish. So, <laughs> so, um, so that's that's the point of that quote. The whole pamphlet bears reading because it goes into the problems with the rump parliament, all sorts of things. And of course, it's it, it's in that amazing time of the publishing plan, uh, pamphlets and when Robert Hardy was tried for sedition and treason, um, uh, which was in a wonderful dramatization called Garrow's Law. Um, and there's a, a very, very um, uh, wonderful passage where uh, the uh, barrister defending Hardy actually talks about liberty and habeas corpus and all sorts of things. And, and there's a link to that in the tone for each channel and, and in recent blogs uh, but but that 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 really ranjan is, is is the purpose of that okay um so burke was saying um that people that want to take advantage of the situation that are higher up they do things there are patterns in what they do but what they do is they dress it up differently every time uh and so they should, because if not, it would be too obvious that they're doing the things that they do. And then, then you, give, you examples give examples of the types of things that they do. Yeah, that's correct. So um, John Kenneth Galbraith in um, the 
television series, uh, The Age of Uncertainty. On the finance thing, he says, um, in, in finance, there, there's no other industry that, that basically has, you know, innovation is just in a different name for the same thing. It's the same basic. We're, we're in the same Babylonian accounting system now as um, the Jews in exile actually encounters in Babylonia. And, and it's basically called double entry um, bookkeeping and double entry bookkeeping is Babylonian. Um, there are, you know, it, some things are rediscovered from sort of ancient times or whatever and, and other people are so, so, the, the benefit of, 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 of all the credit yeah, for yeah. it but but the double so you mean so, you so, mean, so, so what you're saying, what you're is, saying is that, is that um, um, when they say that um an italian guy called luca pacioli invented or created double entry bookkeeping that actually that existed already yep that's correct that's absolutely correct okay okay, okay. i didn't know yeah, i didn't know that um yeah well i mean it's it's just uh, it is it, ha- it is true so yeah. um yeah. anyway uh so our behind hand review starts uh with this timeline on the pdf that i just outlined and then the next uh timeline that i recommend for people is the excellent bilderbergers movie by daniel estelin and so the the video, okay, um, is on YouTube, uh, and um, this is just basically the different uh, different points in the episodes as you go through through them. But just as a high level explanation, um, the video is a documentary about the Builder Group a secretive organization that brings together powerful individuals from finance, politics, and the media to discuss and potentially shape global agendas. The film explores the influence of this group in globalization, deindustrialization, and the control of key decision makers. The journalist who made the film reveals that he has faced attempts to stop his investigation by the Bilderberg group, okay? And um, so basically all, all the episodes, if you like, within the film, um, the storyboard, if you will, uh, are, are extracted here using chat GPT. And so, um, for instance, if we just, uh, if I come down to here and press that, uh, it starts, that's starting, that should be 748, it doesn't seem to be. No, they, they aren't working. They work when I'm not online. I think there's probably just not enough power to do that. But anyway, the, the, the sections are there and it breaks it down. And the timeline of the movie starts with the Swedish meeting of the Bilderbergers in 1973. Um, and it, it's, it's a very good movie. Uh, there are several others, which will, I will put in the blog, but I'm not going to go into them. Now, this movie is in high definition on the Tone Freaks BitChute channel, and there's a link to that. You can see there David Rockefeller having lunch. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the, the setup, if you like. Uh, 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 the um, it, it, It's sort of the, uh, it's the bass frequency to, 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 to get the harmonics of these different points I'm gonna make, okay? And so the next thing then is, um, I did this blog uh, called What Next for the Money Power, Snakes and Adders, uh, Conquest of Dough, COVID Purpose, the Carbon Gold Standard. Okay, so the Carbon Gold Standard is my um, m- my belief, which I think is supported by facts, that the central bank digital currencies and the future monetary system will be based on um, a ratio of good carbon, i.e. renewables carbon, to hydrocarbons, oil, coal, other hydrocarbons, and the ratio is 16 to 1, which is the old uh, bimetallic ratio that's ancient, okay? So we've talked about that before. Um, And then um, it goes in then to um, 
this bit, which I'll just read. So this is a long post. My initial question to myself was, who lent the money to George Soros to break the Bank of England? So that's Black Friday, OK? Uh, this post resulted, and I'm digesting the linkages and pondering the questions arising. Why is Mark Carney being afforded such a prominent position in our public discourse? What next for the money power? Now, Mark Carney had been the governor of the Bank of England, but he's still very involved in climate change politics and that's because the green new deal and the, that's what they want to base the new money system on um so um now just as a setup for this the admission of 1924 was reginald mckenna blew the gaff on the banking system in his now famous admission to the shareholders of the midland bank in january 1924 and he said this I'm afraid the ordinary citizen will not like to be told that the banks can and do create money. Um, the amount of money in existence varies only with the action of the banks in increasing and decreasing deposits and bank purchases. Every loan, overdraft or bank purchase creates a deposit and every repayment of a loan, overdraft or bank sale destroys the deposit. And they who control the credit of a nation direct the policy of governments and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. So Liz Truss made this point the other day. People focused on what she didn't say that she didn't criticize Tommy Tommy Robinson, right? Now, um, actually, uh, she was quite right to say she got the sack, but couldn't sack, sack, sack um, Andrew Bailey. I think Andrew Bailey has been deliberately crashing the economy, right? And I've been saying that um, since they started hiking rates, even before the so-called Kamikaze budget, okay? So, so the next thing then I do is in this blog is say, let's get the charges of anti-Semitism out of the way, OK, because I quote this guy called Eric Dudley, Dudley Butler, who apparently was an anti-Semite. Right now. Um, and, and, and he made some really stupid things like he says the Jewish people set up the Bank of England. He did. They didn't. Huguenots did. And Calvinists. So Calvinists came over from Holland um, and. Um, Oliver Cromwell was a was a, was a Calvinist, um, and uh, he was also a Zionist, right? So evangelical Zionism and Calvinist Zionism, okay, um, is as influential, at least, as um, uh, uh, Herzl's Zionism, okay, and it's a political movement. It's not. A religious thing it's not a faith-based thing right uh, mo many orthodox true torah Jew jews like rabbi shapiro for instance um do not and, and object to uh being included in a diaspora of of israel for instance now i i i i, I think Benjamin Netanyahu is out of out of, of control, and I think Likud were going to get the boot. And obviously, all the stuff that's happening in Gaza, they're only in power because of War Powers Acts, emergency, all this sort of thing. Uh, and it's keeping Netanyahu out of jail, in my opinion. Right now, uh, before all that happened, there were loads of mass protests in Eng in Israel about Netanyahu's attack on the Israeli Constitution. You're starting, so you're to, starting wander to wander off topic, Get back to, Get the, back thing. to the thing. Yeah. So the, anyway, the, the, so the, 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 the guy, guy, the guy the, who discussing these things doesn't Black come Black Black. from an anti-Semitic place. That's what I'm saying. And I, I, I yeah, always okay. get that out of the way first, right? So, according to the principles of social credit, okay, um, the real fight was between the money power and monarchy with the victory of the money power. In 1688, James II, driven off the phone, etc., William III, all that stuff, okay? And then I say Calvinism is arguably by far the most telling influence on the course of British political economy. And Tierra Mason explains that in uh, that link there, uh, in a uh, thing about Calvinist Zionism, right? Um, and he says the desire for a Jewish homeland among the Jewish 
diaspora is commonly understood to explain the origins of political Zionism in the mid late 19th century, but that is only part of the story. This article is a brief introduction to the key role of the inheritors of Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth in its realization in the state of Israel by actively seeking to harness the diaspora to their purposes. Okay, um, so uh, Calvin said, this is a direct quote from Calvin. I mean, obviously he said it in German, but um, Belloc quoting Calvin, Calvin okay, um, characterized the Reformation as a rising of the rich against the poor. We're in the middle of another uh, re 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 uh, reformation. And indeed, Calvin had written the unfortunate statement, the people must always be kept in poverty in order that they remain obedient. OK, um, then there's a little bit about the Hublum family that founded the Bank of England, etc. Um, uh, there's a link to William Patterson's connection to the Darien scheme, which is a Ponzi scheme uh, back in the early days of the Bank of England. Then I say the fish always rots from the head. I've got an article about who have been the governors of the Bank of England since the early 70s, OK, because this is the timeline. And then we've got Liz Truss. Um, I don't know if you'll hear this, but I'm just going to see if it will play. Watch this. Watch this. As I thought, as I that, thought if I that if I got to the top of the tree, I would be able, to, be implement able to implement those conservative, those conservative policies. Do you think once you're prime minister, minister yeah, I, as a low brow thing, if I get prime minister, I'll be like Churchill, change the country. Exactly. That's not how it works. Exactly. 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 And, what and what I discovered was that I was, was not holding the levers. The levers were held by the Bank of England, by the Office of Budget Responsibility. They weren't held by the Prime Minister or the Chancellor. What's the name of this? Yeah, so that's worth watching in full, but that that's nail on head time. So a combination of that comment of George Galloway winning the Rochdale election and the second by a by country mile independent cover, uh, uh, candidate, that's why Rishi Sinek was, Sinek was on the steps of Downing Street you know, wetting the bed. Um, so there he is. Andrew Bailey becomes the 12th, 121st governor of the bank on March the 16th. Um, I think it was March the 16th, 2020, possibly 21. I'm not quite sure. And then there are a couple of videos. Professor Vernon. No, he came in, he came in, he came in, he came in, in 2020. In 2020. Because the yeah. first because thing the first he did, thing when, he he did when he came in, in was the liquidity, liquidity injection coordinated globally. globally. You know, COVID. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, the little known fact of the IMF crisis of 1976. So this is part of the reason that Margaret Thatcher got in in 79 was this IMF crisis. Now, the IMF crisis is very similar to the more famous ERM crisis with Norman Lamont. Right. Um, but the story of the IMF crisis is related to the last time monetary arrangements changed. And that timeline comes from the late 60s. Um, so this is um, de Gaulle asking for the gold back for France, not wanting to be in NATO um, and so forth. And the new Bretton Woods. So Bretton Woods was post Second World War. Um, America and the Nixon shock coming off the gold standard, etc. OK, this is this is all part of the IMF crisis that we had in Britain. OK, it's very well explained by Professor Bagdana. Um, this is um, basically R Roger, of, Roger, yeah. Roger, Roger. Can you just Can say you a just... little bit more about de Gaulle not wanting to be a NATO? Uh, I, I did a really long blog about it about six years ago, and, and my memory isn't that fresh on it um but effectively um he called the united states um as a state being able to issue uh the world's reserve currency an exorbitant privilege and it was an exorbitant privilege that had been exploited for war ends in vietnam um and uh he was unhappy with that didn't feel that the uh united states 
was a safe bet. The French gold had been sent over there for safekeeping to keep it away from the Germans because during the gold, gold standard, etc., it was all very important stuff. Uh, and Gaul asked for the gold back. The gold came back. Speculation started where the Fort Knox had the gold it said it had to back up its own currency and all this sort of thing. Um, there, are, That's a kind of a, a monetary history. It's very important. It's not cork sniffy. Um, there's a very, very good... Um, article which isn't linked to in here um note to self i will put it in there um which explains all of that stuff uh bretton woods the gold Thank standard you. um also uh, when in when britain came off the gold standard in the uh late 20s early 30s there's a famous a letter from churchill to the treasury and i've done blogs and quite a lot of analysis of that these are different monetary crises that we've had that that they're, they're periodic okay but the very big ones lead to massive changes in the constitutional arrangements between the people and you know the power structure and the levers of the power structure as liz trust correctly points out are with central banks and global international banks and basically they're they're eating everybody else's lunch including the smaller banks there's a there's an ongoing um crisis in smaller banks in america so svp is the one that everybody heard about last year uh you, you um the new york community bank is going through the same sort of process at the moment so effectively that's all to do with um bond yields if bond yields go up the value of the bonds go down and therefore the liquidity of banks um uh suffers and if the lender of last resort doesn't step in they go bust now they um and they choose who they will step in and not step in to do so in 2008 for instance they let um lehman's go to the wall i think that was a mistake but that was basically no one liked the chief executive of lehman's um, and he'd refused to help another bank previously and and people remembered this and they decided to you know to stick the boot in uh, rather when you say he refused, refused do you mean um, the long term capital, capital management yes yeah so so there's i mean the, the you know the, the history repeats history rhymes all this sort of thing i i, I basically reckon it harmonizes um and uh the 2009 repo spike was the the reason we needed the response that event 201 was uh, but the event 201, uh, 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 response was actually black rocks going direct and the first thing black rock did was bail out their own etfs exchange traded funds um uh black rock is massively powerful the top three wealth managers are more powerful than most countries in terms of funds under management. And Larry Fink, he could sack Andrew Bailey, uh, but Liz Truss couldn't. And as Liz Truss points out, that's not democratic. And the going direct spring, we've got to change that. And this is, you know, this is where we're at. And, 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 and the way to do it is to use the constitutional apparatus that's actually there and being bequeathed to us by our by our forefathers and mothers i mean it's as simple as that so but, uh, but basically uh, there's oh, a yeah. learning curve yeah. to get your head around you know the uh ju jur juridical um framework that exists okay can be used by the people to hold the um, people who are appointed into power or elected into power, if you believe they're elected, um, and um, uh, they they can't change the rules. They've tried to change common yeah, law yeah. into Roman law, but there's a lot of work to do on that still, which is yeah. why there's Roger, so that's, much. That's, that, that's, that, that's where, where we, we completely, completely disagree. disagree. Okay, well, but, but explain. I'll, I'll, I'll just mute myself, and if you can explain what. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing complex, but you believing in the legal system being able to um, be used for good, um, I think you have a higher belief in that than I do. Um, I think more people are led to believe that that might be possible 
um, than are good outcomes. So I think, you know, it's hugely disproportionate. A lot more people think, oh, yeah, maybe it matters. Maybe it can help. Um, but I think it's generally used to do bad more than good. But we don't need to discuss that because, you know, I'm still paying attention. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I, I accept your point, and it's a good point, and there is a lot of truth in the point you make. I would just counter with Eric Chernoworth's work, which shows that political movements succeed when they're non-violent and actually use official channels um, and also turn people on the inside. Leaders emerge from the inside of systems um, and uh, effectively um, it's preposterous to say all judges and all lawyers are bent or all politicians etc some of the more senior ones or the higher up the greasy pole you get uh, it, it, it gets more difficult but but the rules are in black and white so there's a lot of lawfare going on in the states at the moment but there's a guy called um, Barnes Barnes Law he does a lot of work for Donald Trump a lot of constitutional stuff um, and there's lots of brain power on our sides, including legal brain power. Um, now, the reason Julian Assange is in the mess he's in isn't because he hasn't got good lawyers. It's that the uh, the state is acting thoroughly unconstitutionally and illegally. Now, hopefully, um, people know that. Um, they're not going to know it by looking at the BBC because it doesn't get analysed. But it's our job to actually set that out and explain it. So just an example of that is I supported the rail strikes and all the rest of it. And I did feel that the um, uh, the union, which, oh, which which one, you know, the guy I like, the, the Irish guy. Mick Lynch. Mick Lynch. Say again? Mick Lynch. Mick Lynch. Y yeah, and the guy that works for him, the guy that was in the pub. Yes, the yes. Eddie Dempsey, yeah, I like Eddie Dempsey. I think he's great. Um, so basically, um, I, you see, they're left wing, socialist, Marxist, whatever they, they are, right? To me, they're conservatives, right? Because small c conservatives, we need to conserve the political and constitutional arrangements bequeathed to us by a four, whatever, because they've evolved over time and they're being clawed back, they're being uh, destroyed. Um, and it's in our interest to maintain them um, and use the levers that have been put in place. And so what you've got to do is, 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 is the this is the Ma 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 Mario Savvy point about, you know, putting your bodies across the levers of power and explaining to the people in power that the machine will not work because we're not going to do it. And that is Burke's point about it's kind of hard to do that. And people tend to keep quiet at the time. But if anybody is any doubt that we are living under a tyrannical monopolistic regime, a corporate regime, which is frankly uh, taking the piss, it's worse than taking the piss. It, it, it's committing egregious, egregious crimes. Um, the link to the fines that these people are paying, they're paying indulgences rather than doing porridge, as it were. And, 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 and that is a problem. So, you know, um, Name of the Rose, Umberto Eco, that that book, that film, that's what that's about, about, you know, the, the corruption of the Catholic Church through indulgences. You know, people, you know, the, the Borgias buying the, the papacy and stuff like that. So um, that there's plenty of um, historical precedent to show that um, actually by... Uh, by winning the arguments, and to win the arguments, you have to define your starting assumptions. And this is what this blog that we're talking about is actually doing. It's defining starting assumptions and then giving some uh, further um, meat around the framework. And, and it's, it, 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 it's an additive process um, by people all joining in. Uh, Richard Stolman, the famous computer guy who, who 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 basically is behind what's known as linux it's actually gnu richard stallman says if you share an idea you don't end up with half an idea you end up with two full ideas and they actually compound you end up with more than one idea that's what we've got to do we've got to put our heads together um and the internet 
is stopping that from happening. So this is the inshittification point. The intermediaries are stopping people from ending up with more and better ideas by sharing good ideas and pushing the bad ideas, the moribund, broken down, uh, silly hairbrine theories that have been in the establishment for many years. Um, Manichean um, uh, uh, binary arguments uh, we, we, which actually don't hold water when, when one, you know, um, w w when one debates these things, okay, they can't win a debate because they, they've built their houses, it's a house, it's a house built on sand, it's not built on solid rock. Um, so anyway, um, as I say, the IMF crisis and the snake is little known, but it's a very important part in all this story, it ties in with the 73 Bilderberg minutes. Um, I did a lot of work on the, um, there were vocal histories recorded for the World Bank, um, and you know, people working for the World Bank, talking to their sort of in-house historian, a little bit like Carol Quigley, and some of the things they say, you think, oh, blimey, that's unbelievable. Um, you know, it's quite shocking when you, but, but this information is there, it's happened. Um, a really good compendium of it is the Chadwick stuff. Um, and he, he wrote the introduction to Tragedy and Hope, uh, the, 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 the book that's in print at the moment. But then he also did this compendium to bring it all up to date. Um, and in my own small way, um, I'm kind of bringing a bit up to date from there. But what we're going to get to um, that's the IMF. Here's the ERM. There's John Major there. Um, so conventional view is that Britain joined at the wrong time, namely on the version of impending recession, etc. This is all the ERM stuff. Now, much of the reportage around there is actually not accurate. Um, uh, Bagdanov's, um, rep uh, you know, academic work on it is accurate uh, and I think is worth reading. Um, so you know, like I said, um, George Soros said this in 1992, our total position by Black Wednesday had to be worth almost 10 billion. We plan to sell more than that. In fact, when Norman Lamont, the British finance minister, said just before the devaluation that he would borrow nearly 15 billion to defend sterling, we were amused because that was about how much we wanted to sell. George Soros, 1992. Now, in 2024, OK, 15 billion. Um, I think you've probably got to call that. Well, the monetary base from 92 to now has gone up massively. OK, um, we're now in trillions and a, a trillion is a million million. Well, it depends how, whether you do the American or British or whatever. Um, we're talking telephone numbers. OK, none of which makes sense. And over 80 percent of this telephone number is in the casino economy. OK, just people messing about with with pieces of paper um, and it doesn't add to the wealth of the nation. It doesn't add to the prosperity of communities and individuals within those communities. I think that when you said 15 billion, you did something very clever that I think is very important and useful because you said 15 billion and then you started acting as though you were going to translate that into today's terms. And then we come across that thing, which is, well, how are we going to do it? Are we going to use the Big Mac index? Are we going to use CPI? Are we going to use house prices? But what you did, I thought was very clever and it really helped me because you said, you at least for me, sort of said, well, let's think of 15 billion in 92 as a percentage of the amount of notional value derivatives for example circulating la di da di da back then 15 billion would have been a very high proportion of what was going around globally and the, i think the point that you made has helped me recognize that now um that same percentage from back then, if you took the corresponding financial value, it wouldn't be 150 billion, it would be way more than that. 
you know, I was thinking, oh, yeah, maybe house prices have gone up by this much in the 30 years, you know, or a Coca-Cola might have gone from 30p to 75p, you know. But what you just said, you know, if you take the 15 billion as a proportion of even of money going around the whole world, it was a much bigger amount. Yep, that's absolutely Finish. correct. Um, I've, I've, I've done quite a lot of analysis of it. My favorite analysis I did is, is a video called The Pulling Up of the Housing Ladder, which actually um, brings house prices up to today's terms, compares it to uh, average wages, etc. And what it shows is how financialization has uh, put home ownership and rentals as well, by the way, out of the reach of people's regular salaries. And housing has been turned into a privilege reward, like a rewards point of housing for being the right sort of person, doing the right thing. It's a, it's keeping the bed warm for the social point system, ARDHA system, uh, based on carbon rationing, um, uh, which, 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 which is, you know, in train. It, the, the, the point is, is that the narrative behind it is built on sand. And so they can't they can't do it. They can never justify uh, taxing the air we breathe in. They, they thought, oh, well, what we'll do, we will tax the air that people breathe out. OK, but the, that, was good. That, that, was that was good. That was good. Yeah, well, it's a ridiculous it, it's a ridiculous notion um, and, and ends basically in poverty um, famine and, and all sorts of terrible things um which uh which well which basically the green fascist extremists are, are perfectly happy with you know people like david attenborough that say that people are a plague you know i couldn't disagree with him more on that um so anyway norman lamont blah blah all the stuff is there and this is a really good interview with norman lamont on Sky News, uh, talking about the Maastricht Treaty 25 years on, and he gets into money and um, monetary sovereignty and all the stuff in Maastricht that made Margaret Thatcher say non, <laughs> non, non, non. <laughs> um, so anyway, then I do a bit about the Whig Junto because that's important. The Whig Junto actually shepherded through the formation of the Bank of England. Uh, I did a blog actually saying that Rishi Sunak is actually a Whig junto. They're not a Conservative Party. The only thing Conservative about the Conservative Party now is Conservative Woman, <laughs> the magazine. But you know, in common with Labour, um, they'll probably be export. They'll they'll be expelling all of the Conservatives in the same way. They'll they'll be expelling all of the Democratic Socialists. Uh, you know, basically, it's a uni party, um, and you've got the choice of two colours basically um red or blue or pink or brown you know at the moment in this country um and the the the, the Whig elite and bringing in the bank of england and the rest the restoration being a rising of the rich against the poor that's all true uh so and, and also in that time in history there's something called the medieval um medieval warm period when Chaucer was writing so this is merry old England and the middle ages the, the medieval warm period which has been edited out of the climate change record and all the rest of it to, to support this ridiculous notion that co2 is some carbon dioxide is some sort of control knob which is absolute rubbish it's been it's been falsified scientifically um, ad nauseum um, but still you know the the the, the as Burke called them you know the defenders of the tyranny that they're still doing it you know it, in another 10 years time these people will be laughed at ridiculed when we get out the other side of the going direct spring okay all of the lies that have been told about vaccine vaccine harms um all of the stuff to do with what the event 201 response was all about um it's all coming out now um and uh, i we did the talk about um andrew bridgen on russell brand um a couple of weeks ago anyway just just to round this one off this is one of my favorite quotes and it's actually from a compendium of um uh, samuel taylor coleridge's um correspondence uh, so his published diaries are called Table Talk. Um, and from the entry of the 27th of April, 1823, uh, Coleridge said this, 
The national debt has, in fact, made more men rich than have a right to be so, or rather any ultimate power in case of a struggle of actualizing their riches. It is, in effect, like an ordinary where 300 tickets have been distributed, but where there is in truth room only for 100. So long as you can amuse the company with anything else or make them come in successively, all is well. And the whole 300 fancy themselves sure of a dinner. But if any suspicion of a hoax should arise and they were all to rush into the room at once, there would be 200 without a potato for their money. And the table would be occupied by the landholders who live on the spot. Uh, I mean, I'm surprised that's not quoted more often. I mean, most people aren't into Coldridge as much as I am, I suppose. I mean, I, I love his poem. Um, um, oh, what's it called? Hiawatha. Uh, uh, no, no, he, he wrote a poem. Um, uh, was he the witch? Uh, was he the one who's into opium? Work, 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 with how, work without hope is like uh, nectar in a sieve and beauty without an object cannot live. I mean, they've got to be two of the finest words of poetry in the English language. They're wonderful stuff. Um, you know, obviously Shelley and um, Blake and, I, you know, I, you know, I'm into my poetry. Anyway, here's the Brandt report. OK, and I um, on this was on Facebook back in the day and I was in often used to exchange comments with this person called Ruby Iqbal, said, um, so here we go. Sadly, I think that is true. The oligarchy was firmly secured by the bankers in the 2008 crash. The petrodollar sword of Damocles has haunted every US president since Gerald Ford. And it's clear from published documents and correspondence that the monetary system and banking have been elevated to an importance above democracy and laws. President Trump would have had some idea of the generality of the question, as many do, but only those who put on the shoes of a president or world leader will be made aware of the full picture. Liz, trust anyone? The rest of us can only guess as to what exactly is causing the successive apparent loss of all humanity and reason when office is assumed. I must confess, I felt this more acutely when it happened with Obama. I have been reading the Pearson and Brank Commission reports the past few days, following up on a reference to the Committee of 20 in the 1973 Bilderberg meeting minutes. And there's a link to those minutes. So this one, an Atlantic Japanese energy policy by Walter Levy. And then um, this one, conflicting expectations concerning the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe by Thorwald Stoltenberg. And guess whose daddy is? Jens, Stoltenberg. yeah, he's 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 Jens Stoltenberg's father. I mean, you know, hold you on, see what I mean? I mean, hold on. Hold on. What was the what title was the of that meeting? Did you say the? It was that. What was it? The security was that like Munich? The Munich meeting. Munich meeting. No, it, it, it's the uh, Bilderberg. Was it meeting, NATO? NATO. Uh, I know, but uh, you, know, you know, said that you the. Yeah, it, it's called Organized conflicting expectations. I'll, I'll read it to you. Conflicting expectations concerning the conference of security and cooperation in Europe. Okay, so this this is the summary. Okay, or, 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 and the link is there to the blog, Public Intelligence Net, Bilderberg Security Corporation. So it says, security questions are not isolated aspects of political affairs involving certain parts of foreign policy only. Security problems arise as a result of basic problems in national and world affairs and as such embrace all foreign policy. Foreign policy in its turn is no longer limited to its traditional task of regulating relations between states. Foreign policy is increasingly becoming a tool for the solutions of the most important problems confronting us today, including many of the internal problems of our separate countries. Briefly, these problems are lack of political and even more of a democratic political uh, economic and technological development, both on a national and international level. And here, here are the headings. War and terrorism, limited natural resources, population, environment pollution. So that, that, that is the beginning of the Green New Deal. And Stoltenberg's dad, that is. And then you've got Stoltenberg is now in charge of NATO. So, I mean, the, the, the NATO is basically the new Gestapo. Have you, have you, you know, when, you know, you know, when you notice, when you notice that, that, yeah, have you have seen, you anyone, seen else anyone else talk about, talk about Stoltenberg's dad being uh, the author of that? 
Well, I only noticed it myself the other day because Stoltenberg's been on the telly quite a lot. I mean, obviously, I, I was aware of the minute, but I hadn't taken the trouble to, you know, who, you know, but but it, there, there are dynasties. There are political dynasties. We've got them in this country. They're, they're like von der Leyen's sure, sure. father was the fir- one of the first top bureaucrats. She was born in, born in Brussels. Yeah. You know, it's it's the it's the international superclass. This is what they are. It's a hybridized superclass. In, in my blog, the Iron Law of Oligarchy, I quote two Swedish academics that talk about hybridity and elites and how that all works. And it's a theme. Um, it, uh, in Orwell's um, pamphlet, you know, not counting the the the, 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 the N word. Okay, in that pamphlet. He, he says something similar about the Security Council, about the peace block and all the rest of it. He's basically saying um, <laughs> that the, the British Commonwealth has to remain poor so that the, you know, the super class of Europe can remain uh, in charge of everything. Even though if there's enough, enough to go around, they don't want to share it out because, as Calvin said, the poor must remain poor so they remain obedient. These people are anti-posterity. They are anti um, they're anti-progress. That that that's who they are. Uh, Chesterton mm-hmm. said as much as well when he referred to eugenicists um, in, in in his book *The Utopia of Users*, for instance. Um, oh, so, actually, oh, actually, hold on a hold second, hold on a second, because second. Second. Obviously, obviously we're going to have to wrap up soon. soon. But, but but I, I have, have, to, have say to say this. Obviously, obviously everything is relevant. Is relevant. But, but you know how you, you know just how mentioned. You just mentioned um, the eugenicists. Um, I think it was uh, Jimmy Savile's mate, Esther Ranson, this week gone by, because she's got cancer. She has been using her status to get stories out there saying how much she, basically she's really happy at assisted dying she's pushing assisted dying in um in the media and people did say it could lead to people dying i mean it didn't quite say yeah so basically their organs might be worth something so we might just kill people for the organs you know burke and hair style organ trafficking but i mean organ trafficking is not the only reason for me opposing assisted dying but yeah. Anyway, sorry. It's just because you mentioned you just, 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 just on that point, um, Professor Daniel Robson, rest in peace. I mean, basically, he was my philosophy lecturer only because I did his course on the great courses. All his lectures, all his notes, I studied them for about two years really extensively. Um, and he, before he died, he gave a talk about things like assisted dying and, and euthanasia and, 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 and all, um, forced organ. Um, so, and, and he was dead against it. I, I mean, he, he, his talk, it, it's linked to on the blog. If, if you search in uh, Longhead Musings, the, the, the current yeah, sort of yeah. Grub Street Journal, if you put in Professor Daniel Robinson, you'll find the video. Uh, but, but, um, Roger, are, are you happy to shoot off screen? Is there much is in your blog left? Yeah, there is. I, I'll just whiz through just 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 to sum up, okay? Because this this is all just the the base um, thing. Um, so people can go through it. There's Bernard Latio's uh, integral thing, some integral stuff, um, some more integral stuff. That's the psychological part of it. My yeah, and this yeah, stuff goes really, really well with, with our, our chat, chat earlier this earlier morning. This morning, yeah. Well, I mean, we were, that's what we were talking about. There's complex of conspiracy, the uh, pigeon um, thing. Right. This is John Ronson's series, Secret Rulers of the World. It was supposed to be a piss take, but it's more like a documentary now, a serious documentary, because most of the stuff in it has been proven to be correct and not conspiracy theory. Um, so anyway, and then I, I say, was, he, was saying, he saying, was, saying was, hold on, hold on. Was, was, he, was saying he saying some crowds believe, believe this, 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 this? Yeah. And now it turns, now out, it that turns out, out that it's all true. true. Yeah. Anyway, look, let me just, I, I, I'll whiz through this. Give me five minutes and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. So this is the introduction to my 
um, Conquest of Doe website for the novel, okay? And I say this, in setting out these pages, I'm acutely aware that with each link, each map, and each film, readers are on the edge of a labyrinth of rabbit holes and may be nervous of the charge if found furtively browsing these pages of conspiracy theorist. Take heart, no conspiracies are required. What is, however, apparent is manipulation, especially of the psychological variety. Fear of the label conspiracy theory is but one such of these psychological manipulations. Um, so they're, they're not, this is from Complex of Mystery, talking about David Hume. Um, so let us start with history in the electronic edition of the collected works and correspondence of David Hume. The word conspiracy occurs 191 times. Conspiracies 45 times, conspirators 70 times, conspirator 12 times. And it just goes on to say, you know, of course there are conspiracies. And he, he, he basically wrote a, um, uh, an answer to um, uh, that there are two characters that debate something in Coriolanus. I think it's Coriolanus, the, the, the Italian Shakespeare play, is it? Which okay. one is it? Okay. Anyway, so that's worth looking at. I, I made a reading of it. So, so, so for negotiating this labyrinth, I offer this rather long, although informative ball of string, as Ariadne gave to Theseus. A dialogue that was published in the early 70s of a disputation between Scouts and Quigley, authors both of two books dealing with the same material as dealt with here on this site, and by extension the novel The Conquest of Doe. So take good heed of the old poem, The Elephant of Hindustan, and read this dialogue. And there it is. And so that's the beginning of our timeline for our 50-year behindhand review. Um, then Letters from Mesopotamia. This is a brilliant video. This guy's great. Uh, Irving Finkel, who's at British Museum. Uh, Leo Oppenheimer's book. He wrote a couple of introductory essays, which are absolutely stellar. Um, and then here's a quote from George Soros, okay? Markets are inherently unstable, or at least potentially unstable. An appropriate metaphor is the oil tanker. Uh, they are very big, and therefore you have to put in compartments to prevent the sloshing around of oil from capsizing the boat. The design of the boat has to take that into account, and that the uh, depression regulations actually introduce uh, these very tight watertight compartments and deregulation has led to the end of compartmentalization okay um and that's a quote from the inside job which um uh from the transcript which is linked to okay uh very good film that charles ferguson um and this is sir walter osler who's uh basically uh, <coughs> uh an elite sort of person all tied up with self-improvement in the early um, 20th century, 1914. He says this, basically says the same thing as Taurus. Uh, and then this is Frederick Nietzsche, okay? So this is important in terms of context. I'm going to read this Nietzsche quote. Every living thing can become healthy, strong and fruitful only within a horizon. If it is incapable of drawing a horizon around itself, or on the other hand, too selfish to restrict its vision to the limits of a horizon drawn by another, it will wither away feebly or over hastily to its early demise. Cheerfulness, clear conscience and carefree deed, faith in the future, all this depends in the case of an individual as well as of a people on there being a line which distinguishes what is clear and in full view from the dark and unilluminable. It depends on one's being able to forget at the right time as well as to remember at the right time on discerning with strong instinctual feelings when there is need to experience historically and when unhistorically. Precisely this is the proposition the reader is invited to consider. The unhistorical and the historical are equally necessary for the health of the individual, a people and of a culture. And that's basically the same thing that, 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 that um, uh, Edmund Burke is saying. And, and we'll wrap up on this. This is the brilliant um, Climate Change, Land Use and Monetary Policy, The New Trifector uh, by Geraldine Perry. And it's it's the most succinct summary of all these things. It's about a 300 page book. I've got it on Kindle. I often read it on the aeroplane. It's brilliant on money. Um, and um, th there's a summary of what it says here. So I've got all that, those summaries. And then here's the event 201 finance discussion. Um, and if we just keep scrolling down, this is a video about communicating climate change. You know, basically don't 
don't don't talk about and this is all about you need to be emotional um and you know um so anyway uh this is me reading a blog that i did called do not have two differing weights in your bag one heavy and one light um which is from Deuteron deuteronomy um and a and basically a summary of that and then we'll round off just with this poem i wrote called ties of the dollar moon uh which is i, I think i wrote this in 2016 so I, i'm going to round off with just just reading this poem um, and hopefully there's enough in this video to inspire people to look at some of the links go to the going direct paradigm mind map go to wiki ballot do the monetary quiz etc so th this is my poem time tides and the nature of things the dollar moon a planet to its star must look, the planet no less needs its moon. As the sun is the store of energy new, the moon drives and regulates currents of the tides, time and the nature of things. That golden orb gives all, that silvery moon regulates all. Both work together, even as the other seemingly sleeps. And yet, currents of the tides, time and the nature of things pass. On the nature of man-made things, on a standard of gold, which Jennings would not be crucified upon, that cross of gold alone, hard food of Midas, no tides to complement the orb. For silver was its currency, the silvery moon to that cross's golden sun, which means of exchange fed the common man. The silver moon drives and regulates currencies of the tides, time and the nature of things. Time passed, and man forsakes the golden orb and its silvery moon. No credit he gave to drivers of tides, time, and the nature of things. Fiat of imperial rule enforces debts, new tides in political economy. Fiat dictates the new tides of commerce. Ephors of debt above and astride the law. No silvery moon complementary to the golden orb. There are no tides by means of which the common man may be fed. Hard food of Midas alone, starvation. King Canute-like, those ephors wave, bidding the advancing tide backwards. Still they advance, tides in a tsunami of debt, tides of a dollar moon by fiat, hegemonic tides of a dollar moon. So, and you know, my trilogy of poems, Conquest of Doe, this blog, you know, that that's in my heart and in my mind. And these are the true justifiable beliefs, which I act in accordance with. Um, and so um, I'm not trying to persuade anyone to believe me. I'm just saying, look, I believe these things and I will act and face the uncertainty of the future knowing or believing these things to be true and that's all any of us can do in conversation and communication with our fellow human being i love it i love it um, um putting that out and have another, have another look at it and look listen, it, to, and you, listen um, to you um because it, 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 it's compact, it's compact. Uh, yeah i like the yeah, rhythm, I like and the rhythm and hegemonic tides, hegemonic tides of the dollar moon, dollar moon. It, Club, Club. Ben, ben uses the uses word. The word. Yeah, you're breaking up now, Ranjan. Right, it looks like we've lost Ranjan there now, folks. So um, thanks very much if you do watch this. No one watched it live, but we did it live. Um, I'll chop out the dead space at the beginning. Um, but uh, yeah. I recommend London Conversation, Ranjan's Financial Eyes channel, um, and obviously Wiki Ballot, um, the Go and Direct Paradigm Mind Map. Links to all of these things uh, are in the blog, um, and I'm happy to respond to any comments or to you know, um, you know, let's get on, let's do it, let's have our Going Direct uh, spring, let's do it, people, and be lucky, and remember that, you know. Well, remember that God loves you. Thank you.